Hi everyone, my name is Jen. I'm an author and a book reviewer and today is Tuesday the 14th of March and this morning about two hours ago, because I'm taking a little break from work, about two hours ago the International Booker Prize long list was announced and I have been very restrained and I have not looked at the internet but we're going to look at that list together right now and then I'm going to decide which out of the 12 or 13 because sometimes it's 12 sometimes it's 13 books I would like to read I'm going to go ahead and track down those books and read them and then talk to you about them in this video I recently in the last two days uploaded a video where I read all of this year's women's prize long list and if you would like to see that I'll link it in the description box down below um, I am not going to be, I think, I mean I haven't seen the list yet, maybe I'll want to read every single book, but I don't think I'm going to be reading all of the books from this year's International Book Along List. I'm just going to read the ones that really appeal to me. Maybe I'll come back to more when the shortlist is announced in April. I don't know. I'm feeling more uh, flowy <laughs> with this one. I did the same thing last year because there were quite a few books that just weren't going to be for me and I could tell that and some that definitely appealed to me and I wanted to check them out and I am not feeling very completist about this list in general so um, much more casual this but maybe we'll read about half the long list I think that's what I did last time about half so the International Booker Prize is a prize that celebrates translated work and it also awards both the author and the translator which is great they split the prize 50 50 and I've been following it for the past I don't know how many years since it started actually because it hasn't been around that long it's obviously an extension of the Booker Prize um so oh predictions I, <laughs> I haven't thought about this very much predictions off the top of my head thinking about things that are eligible I think the dates are 1st of May last year to 30th of April this year. Um, maybe, uh, is it Our Share of Night by Mariana Enriquez? I haven't read that one. Diary of a Void by Emmy Yagi, I loved. Um, what else has been published? Oh, Siaka Murata had her short story collection, Life Ceremony. There was Chinatown, I think that was published by Tilted Axis in the last year. Uh, Owlish by Dorothy Itza. Um, Normally, or I say normally, at least last year, Fitzcarraldo dominated the long list. I mean, by dominated, I mean they just had more books than, than any other publisher. It wasn't as though they had most of the long list or anything like that. But I'm always um, thrilled to see small publishers on this list like uh, Fitzcarraldo, Tilted Axis Press and other stories, uh, Pushkin, You Run. Europa. Oh, Whale was published in the last year, which I think is a book from quite a long time ago. I want to say 20 years ago in Korea, but it was translated this year. So it is eligible, even though it's an older book, because it's been given a new lease of life through this translation. And it has the most stunning cover. That one's published by Europa. And I have wanted to pick that one up, but then I heard mixed things about it. So I've held off if it's on this list, and I think I will pick it up. My brain is now forgetting every other book that's ever been published so I will stop making half-hearted predictions and let's just look at the list shall we because I can put myself out of my misery uh very very quickly okay let's go to their website oh okay I can immediately say see that whale has been long listed and none of my other predictions <laughs> were correct which is fine because I did not put much thought into that and because I'm looking at a picture of all of the long listed books Currently, I own none of them. None of them. Okay, all right, let's see the books in more detail. I'm just gonna go through them on the order that they're listed on their website. So first we've got Ninth Building by Zhu Xingji, and this is translated from the Chinese by Jeremy Tiang. He translates Yang Gi's work, Strange Beasts of China, I absolutely loved. Now I have to say, this is a terrible cover. It's one of the worst covers. I have ever seen. Um, okay, so this is, uh, who is this published by? Honford Star. It says, it's a fascinating collection of vignettes based on the author's life in China during the Cultural Revolution. So I think what I will do with this one is I will, well, with most of them actually, I'll try and find samples of the books because I'm interested in the writing style and whether or not you know that appeals to me. So I will check out a sample of that book. The next one we've got A System So Magnificent, it is Blinding by Amanda Svensson, which is translated from the Swedish by Nicholas Smalley. I have heard about this one and there's something about it that appeals to me, but I'm not quite sure. It's about three 
triplets I think obviously there's three of them they're triplets so it's about three siblings who are triplets and they don't really speak anymore and they live very different lives I think one of them has even joined um is it like a doomsday cult on Easter Island? Yes, that's correct. So that just seems a bit, maybe, maybe a little bit absurd. I'm not sure if this is a satirical book and that doesn't always appeal to my sense of humour. But I do like this, which says that one of the triplets is called Matilda and she's in Sweden trying to escape from the colour blue. <laughs> that does tickle me. But I'm not immediately drawn to that one. Next we have a Fitzcarraldo. I just realised that we don't have any tilted axis on this list, that's a bit of a shame. Okay, so we have Stillborn by Guadalupe Natal, and this is translated from the Spanish by Rosalind Harvey. Um, Guadalupe is from Mexico, and this book has been on my radar, but I am feeling quite, I felt quite anxious about it. It's called, I said what it's called, I said it's called Stillborn, yes, and it's about a group of friends who have different feelings on motherhood. They had previously said to each other they didn't really want to be mothers um one of them decides to uh go down that route one of them i think changes her mind um but then struggles to get pregnant and one gets pregnant but has complications and um you know i'm going through ivf and stuff at the moment and it's not a book that i felt so i particularly want to read just because of personal circumstances but it is only 200 pages and I have heard good things so I might check this one out and just you know if I find it's really not for me then I can always put it down can't I it's just a book I can do a joey I can put it in the freezer I'm just looking over this list actually and I think there are 13 books this year I think each of these books is from a different country which doesn't always happen and if that's right that's very exciting we can confirm that as we keep going Okay, so this next book is translated from the Tamil. It's called Pyre. It is by Piramal Murugan and it's translated by Enerudan Vasudevan. And this one I don't think is um, one that I'm going to pick up because it is a love story and I'm just, I tend not to gravitate towards love stories, but this is about um, a man and a woman who fall in love. They're from different castes in India um, and they, I think, are hiding their relationships from everyone or maybe they're just hiding their backgrounds from other people probably would be difficult to hide your marriage from other people so they're hiding their backgrounds from everyone around them and I think that this leads to something quite dangerous um, next we have another Fitzcarraldo this is called while we were dreaming but this one isn't published yet so I can't read it in this video. This one is by Clemens Mayer translated from the German by Katie Derbyshire and it's about a group of friends who were 13 when the Berlin, world, Berlin? Berlin Wall fell and then it's about them I think meeting up later in life. Um, so yeah I can't read that one because it isn't out until the end of March. Then we have got excuse me, The Birthday Party by Laura Mavignan. It's translated from the French by Daniel Levin Becker. This is one that I am going to check out the writing style of. It's set in rural France and I think it's set over the course maybe of one day. It's about a man called Patrice who is planning a surprise party for his wife. An inexplicable event start to disrupt the Hamlet's quiet existence. Anonymous menacing letters, an unfamiliar car rolling up the driveway, and as night falls, strangers stalk the house, unleashing a nightmarish chain of events. I really like the sound of that, so I will check out the writing style and see if I uh, enjoy that too. The next one I would like to read, but again, isn't published, and this one isn't published until the end of April, so I can't read this one in this video, but this is Jimi Hendrix Live in Lviv by Andrei Kirchhoff, and it's translated by Ruben Wally, so this is a novel from Ukraine, and uh, I believe that this author has been referred to as Ukrainian Murakami, forgot Murakami's name for a second, and that's quite reductive, obviously, but should give some idea as to what his writing is like. So I think that this is uh, leading up to and including the Russian invasion of Ukraine and includes magical realism. So I would like to read that, but um, I can't because it is not published yet. So maybe when it's out, I will pick it up. Next, we have a Norwegian novel. It's called Is Mother Dead? This is by Vigdis Sjort and it's translated from the Norwegian by Charlotte Barsland. So this is about an artist whose work is focused on motherhood and this causes her to reflect on her relationship with her own mother. And this one does sound like something that I would like to pick up. So I think 
that I will. This next novelist, uh, Gaz, is Ivorian. This is called Standing Heavy and it's translated by Frank Wynne. This I think is satirical and as I said, I'm not always drawn to that, but I'm gonna check out a sample of this to see if I want to read it. It says, it's a unique insight into everything that passes under a security guard's gaze, which also serves as a searingly witty deconstruction of colonial legacies and capitalist consumption. So I think I do want to check that one out, but I will read a sample just to make sure. This next one, I'm really sad about because you can't get hold of it. Um, it came out in hardback last year, but the paperback is coming out later this month, so at the end of March. So I'm definitely going to pre-order a copy of the paperback. Um, you can't get a copy of the hardback unless you pay an extortionate amount of money. It's out of stock everywhere. So this one, what is it, Jen? This is by a Bulgarian writer, Gordy Gospodinov, and this is called Time Shelter. It's translated by Angela Riddell. And this is a novel where an unnamed narrator is tasked with collecting the flotsam and jetsam of the past from 1960s furniture to 1940s shirt buttons and arranges, I believe, each floor of a building to look like a specific period. And that is to help people with Alzheimer's. So it is to transport people back in time and make them feel more settled and more comfortable and yeah I just think this sounds great <laughs> but I can't read it yet I'm very 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 sad about it I mean I can read it in a few weeks though. I will cope. Next we have a writer from the Caribbean. We've got Maurice Condé and this is translated by Richard Philcox. It's called The Gospel According to the New World. And I believe this is about a boy who is told that he is exceptional, that he is a child of God and then it's following him through his life to try and understand why someone has said this about him. I'm intrigued by that and I do want to read it, so I will pick that one up. Then we have Whale, which was the only one that I managed to predict could be on this list, which is a Korean book and it's by Chung Myung Kwan and it's translated from the Korean by Chi Young Kim. This I thought was a collection of short stories, but actually I'm not sure it is. It says it's set in a remote village in South Korea and it follows the lives of three linked characters. An extremely ambitious woman who has been chasing an indescribable thrill ever since she first saw a whale crest in the ocean. Her daughter who communicates with elephants and a one-eyed woman who controls honeybees with a whistle. This is why I've been hesitant to pick it up because it does use bodily difference. Um, so her daughter is mute. And then, as I said, we have a woman with one eye. I'm not sure how that's going to be handled, um, but I will give it a go and see what I think of that. And then finally, we have Boulder by Eva Balsar. This is editing, Jen, just quickly popping in because I forgot to say that this book is translated from the Catalan by Julia Sanchez. And this is about two women who fall in love on a ship and they decide that they're going to live together in Reykjavik. One of them wants to be a mother, one of, is very ambivalent about it and it's about their different feelings towards that. So we have quite a few books on the list this year which are examining motherhood or potential motherhood in various different forms, which is quite exciting. And I was correct that all 13 of these are from different countries. So that is very cool as well. Right, I'm gonna find some samples of these books, have a read, and then um, pop back in and tell you which ones I am gonna be reading in this video. And then I can come back once I have those books and we can, we can read. Okay, so reading through the samples, I have decided that I'm gonna read Boulder by Eva Balthazar. I'm gonna give Stillborn a go and see what I think of that one. I'm also going to read Is Mother Dead? Gospel According to the New World, Whale, and Standing Heavy. So those are the ones that I am going to at least start with. So that's six, so that is half of the long list and I am happy with that. So I will find copies of those books, I will start reading them and then I will check back in with you once I have more to say. Hello, good afternoon, it is the next day. I'm feeling super sleepy today. I think it's because I've had to film lots of different videos for different publishers and I've been editing for too long. So I'm sitting down here with a cup of tea to talk to you for a minute and gather my thoughts because last night I read Stillborn and 
have things to say about it. Um, also, this box, if I can lift it, oh, arrived on my doorstep today. And I'm pretty sure that inside is a whole load of translated books. These are some of my books that have been translated into other languages. And um, that's a joyful thing. And uh, we're talking about translation, so let's talk about those things. In fact, let's peer into this box first while I'm waiting for the caffeine to kick in so I can be more coherent when doing the book review. I was correct. It is a lot, a lot of books. If you're new, I'm an author. That's my primary job. I write for both kids and for grown-ups. I have 10 books published with two new books coming out this year. And my books have been translated into, I think, over 20 languages now. And this is a parcel from one of my children's publishers, Thames and Hudson. I've published a series of children's picture books with them and also a middle grade book about fairy tales. In fact, the one that is on top of this pile here is that fairy tale book. It is not a translation. The rest of them are. This isn't. But it's a new printing which has a foil quote on the front here. So this is The Sister Who Ate Her Brothers, which is by me, and it's illustrated by Adam D'Souza. And this new printing has a quote from Neil Gaiman on the front, which is very cool, which says, guaranteed to raise the hairs on the back of your neck. And if you haven't seen this before, I'll give a quick, it's very hard to do these things, a quick flick through. You can see some of Adam's beautiful drawings there. Don't want to give too much away, but this is um, a collection of fairy tales from around the world retold with positive queer representation and representation of disability as well. So now we move on to translated books. Now, some of these, I'm not going to be able to name the translator in this video because some of these are books, say, that have been translated into Japanese and obviously their alphabet is different and I can't read it. So I can't read the information at the back, which says who has translated it, which is a shame, but I can tell you the translations of the other ones. So in no particular order, we have got Franklin and Luna go to the moon. This is the second book in the series. So there are three, Franklin's Fine Bookshop, Franklin and Luna go to the moon, and Franklin and Luna and the Book of Fairy Tales. And these are picture books for kids aged three to seven or anybody who happens to love dragons and books. So this is the second book in the series in Czech. And this is translated by Katerina Beliova. And I love how in Czech versions of my books, there's also uh, an over at the end. So I'm Jen Campbellova in Czech. I don't know why, but I just really, really enjoy that. This is the Portuguese version of Franklin and Luna Go to the Moon. This is translated into the Portuguese by Susana Carasso Ferreira. And if you want to have a quick look inside, here is uh, one of the pages, because you can see that not only has, obviously, the main text been translated, but also Katie's drawings of text have had to be translated as well. Then we have got the Castilian version of the third book in the series, Franklin and Luna and the Book of Fairy Tales. And this is translated into the Castilian by Rosa Boras Montagne. And then we also have the Catalan version of the second and third books in the series as well. I feel like I'm having to move around a lot because the books are so big. It's so hard to fit them all into the screen. This is translated into the Catalan by Rosa Maria Borares Montagne and also Cristina Rodriguez Fisher. And then as I said, there are some languages where I can't credit the translator immediately in this video because the alphabet means that I can't read their names. So we have the Japanese version of the third Franklin book. We have got the Korean edition of the first book in the series. The Ukrainian translation of the first book in the series, Franklin's Flying Bookshop. And then all three paperbacks in simplified Chinese, which I think are published in China as a set, as well as being able to buy them individually, which is very, very cool. It is always so surreal to receive books in the post that I have written but can no longer read because somebody else has has translated them. I think the strangest one for Franklin is it being translated into German because something that I didn't re realise, because I, I don't read German, but something I didn't realise until I'd had my work translated into German, how long German translations are. 
And that can be a problem when you're looking at word placement on a page, because Franklin is quite a wordy picture book. He's about 950 words long, but in German that is extra long. I don't know. I just find it really, really cool. And I am very grateful to my publishers and translators for getting these books out into the world, especially because Franklin's Fine Bookshop, if you haven't read it, is about a dragon who loves books and wants to share his love of books with the world. So it just seems extra cool that Franklin gets to fly all around the world in lots of different languages. Okay, so I feel like maybe the caffeine is starting to kick in and now I can talk to you about what we are here to talk about, which is the International Booker Longlist. Still Born by Guadalupe Natal is translated from the Spanish by Rosalind Harvey. This is uh, an author from Mexico and it is her fourth book. And this is the one that I said I was slightly anxious to pick up because it is exploring IVF, disability, and um, whether or not you want to be a parent. So our protagonist is Laura. She has decided that she doesn't want to be a mother and she's known that for a very long time and she's very fed up with people asking her when she's going to have children. So she decides to, in her words, have her tubes tied and her mother is extremely angry about this and then when she starts to tell her group of friends that she's decided to do this, She's surprised because the women closest to her had also said that they didn't want to have children. And it turns out that her best friend in particular, Alina, has changed her mind. So Alina has changed her mind and she has decided that she does want to try and be a mother. And her and her partner try for a long time. They don't get pregnant and so they decide to go down the IVF route. And Laura is actually a very selfish friend. <laughs> um, she is not always the most likable person. Um, and I like how that complicated relationship was explored in this book, because I understand that obviously this is a massive life decision for people to make. I've tried to make it myself. As I mentioned earlier, I'm in the process of going through IVF myself. So it's something I've thought about a lot, but it's something that people in general think about a lot and they have to decide for themselves whether or not this is a path that they want to go down. And for some people, ultimately, it ends up not being a choice. They may have chosen to, to try and become a mother and maybe sometimes that doesn't happen and then you're stuck in this, you know, kind of semi-motherhood. It's all very complicated. I've thought about it very much over these past five years. When Alina tells Laura that she wants to be a mum and that she wants to try and become a mother and go down the IVF route, Laura acts a little bit like a petulant child, like her favourite toy is being taken away from her. And it is this simplified feeling, this very raw feeling of my friend is going to change and I'm not going to have the same relationship with her anymore, which is definitely completely understandable. But her reaction and the way that she communicates with her is very very selfish. She says, well, in her head, she says, while Alina got into a muddle in front of her plate of noodles, as she described the new assisted reproduction techniques, my ears slowly closed up like two light sensitive plants. She doesn't want to hear about it. And I think that um, often people can have a very naive vision of what it means to become a parent and how easy that must be for people, and of course, yeah, some people sneeze and seem to get pregnant, but that's not the case for everybody. And I think that Laura is doing this self-preservation in trying to imagine that Alina has crossed over into this other territory. And as the story progresses and Laura sees Alina really struggling with IVF, and then when she becomes pregnant, problems are highlighted in her scan and she's told that her baby is not likely to survive, Laura has to kind of pull herself out of this and realize, wait, so much more is going on here than me just potentially maybe losing my friend or my friendship altering in some way. And in that moment, she has to decide really to become a mother to her friend. This book is all about lots of different kinds of mothering. In many ways, Laura becomes a mother towards her mother. She also becomes quite attached to the son of her next door neighbor and she starts mothering him in a way. And she starts really to see this word mother in a much more three-dimensional way than she maybe thought about it when she was younger. Now, I said it's the next day and I have finished this book. So clearly I raced through it. I read it all last night. It is just over 200 pages, so it's not hugely long. And it's not necessarily because 
I was completely hooked and I had to get to the end to know what was happening. It was more, this is a really difficult book to read. And I really thought that if I put it down and went to bed the next day, I might struggle to pick it up again. And I might just really want to push it away from me in the way that Laura was pushing Alina away from her at the beginning of this book. As I said, Alina does become pregnant and that is in the blurb. And then she's told that her baby is not likely to survive. It, it is an incredibly difficult book about parenthood, mothering, disability. Um, I actually don't know who I would recommend this book to. And if any disabled people are watching this and would like to know more details before going on in, please just DM me and I will give you details. Um, I don't wanna go into too many spoilers here, but I'm happy to talk about content stuff for fellow disabled pals. Um, I really liked some of the imagery in this book. So Alina starts to buy lots of things on a credit card when she's told that her baby is not likely to survive. She says that she feels empty. So basically she's trying to fill herself with consumerism and buy things that she kids herself that she wants because she can no longer have what she needs. Her husband is someone who makes bespoke furniture and he spends his days making customized items um, that cost a lot of money for rich people. Again, tapping into that consumerism, but showing how he's spending his time crafting specific dimensions, finishes, shapes, dreams for people who get to choose exactly what they want in their homes and he is having all of his wants desires and needs taken away from him when it comes to fatherhood there was some clumsy imagery too so at one point laura has pigeons who are nesting on her balcony and she's really annoyed about it because they keep pooing everywhere and making a mess. And then she goes out one day and she sees that one of the eggs has hatched and the bird is bigger than the pigeon should be. And it's very obvious in that scene that this pigeon is not a pigeon and it's a cuckoo. And it has been left by its parents in a pigeon's nest and it is now being brought up by people who are not its biological parents but this is drawn out throughout the whole book. So she notices this and she thinks that's odd, that's a big pigeon. And then later on, she notices again and comments on it and thinks, well, maybe it's not a pigeon. And then she mentions it to a friend who says, I have a friend who knows about birds, maybe I'll ask her. And then at the end, it's like, oh my God, it's a cuckoo. I'm like, I know, everyone knew <laughs> ages ago. So I thought that that was a bit heavy handed and it was supposed to reflect the fact that she's looking after her neighbor's son and she's not his biological mother. I think that this book is attempting to do extremely complex things and in some instances it's very successful, some I'm less convinced of. There's of course that distance because it is Laura who's narrating and she's observing her friend Alina and we're not inside Alina's head who is going through these traumatic events but that alienation kind of highlights that disconnect between these two people who felt as though, at least on one side, Laura's side, that her friendship was going to disintegrate due to motherhood. And now she realises that's not the case. It's just their relationship has to evolve as they become different people and are going through different life experiences. So yes, I, I would recommend the book if you feel like you can handle the subject matter, but please be aware that it is a very, very difficult book to read. And as I said, I'm happy to talk about content. If anyone wants to slide into my DMs, that's absolutely fine. All right. Okay. Um, the next book I'm going to pick up is this one here, which is Standing Heavy. So I will be reading this and then I will report back soon. Hi, it is the following evening and I have finished reading Standing Heavy by Gauss and this is translated from the French by Frank Wynne. This is set in three different time periods, the 1960s, the 1990s and then the 2010s. And in each section we're following undocumented immigrants who become security guards in various different occasions and how each of their lives mirrors the other time periods but the uh, characters that they are observing in their role as security guards. Their lives are, I guess, 
hyperbolized as it goes on. It feels like capitalism is ramping up and up throughout the decades and that is what they're there to observe and to witness. The security guards that are in here and the other undocumented immigrants that are listed throughout the book are from a variety of different places but it's noted that the security guards mainly are black men and as I said they are undocumented immigrants. There's this real irony in that these people have been hired to protect these goods that these establishments are selling or to protect in some instances derelict buildings that nobody is using they are there to perform surveillance and to offer security to these inanimate objects but nobody is offering security to them no one is paying attention to their lives and making sure that they're okay because um society is too busy feeding itself and being self-absorbed. This book moves from being very touching into humorous and has anecdotes from different shops that are along the Champs-Élysées and some of these shops are Sephora's and it'll have different ways of writing Sephora. So the first time it will just have Sephora as it normally is and then um, it is Sephora as if you were um, quite posh and elongating that last vowel. <laughs> and the next time it says Sephora, it says Sephora ah, as if it's really angry and the text is shouting at this shop for existing and just being very frustrated with it. That is quite amusing. And a series of anecdotes and observations that these security guards um, are noting it says outside a carpet as red as a mammal's tongue stretching away lines of pillars painted in black and white stripes from a distance they resemble rows of sharp teeth the entrance to Sephora is the more of a wild beast belching its pungent poly perfumed breath onto the Champs Elysees that really made me laugh and then there's this fantastic line here he felt as though he were in one of the Hollywood movies where the lone hero traverses a post-apocalyptic wasteland in search of a redemptive truth hidden somewhere in the chaos and then here everything is on sale even self-esteem and being a security guard is like being a goalie you stand there watching everyone else play and once in a while you dive to catch the ball i thought this book was very poignant in places and funny in others sometimes the humor didn't always work for me and it's hard to know if that's a translation because humor is very difficult to translate when this book hit i thought it really hit and then at some points i thought it was a bit I don't know, a bit loose, meandering, a bit too listy. But on the whole, I did enjoy this book. And then I have just started reading this one, which is Is Mother Dead by Vigas Hjort. And this is translated from the uh, Norwegian by Charlotte Barsland. And I think this is going to be a book that I adore because it is playing around with language quite a lot so even the title here is mother dead should be a question but there's no question mark and it's really as you start reading because you realize the character doesn't want to know the answer to this question it's not actually a question it's more of a statement so this is about a woman who is an artist from norway and she's been living in the states for the past few decades and she's decided to return home to norway after her husband passed away and she's asked to do a retrospective of her work she's going to put on this huge um, exhibit but her family has disowned her they are estranged her family did not like her previous exhibitions which were exploring family and we don't know or at least we don't know at the very beginning what those exhibitions were like what did she draw why was it so controversial to them i have no idea but at the very beginning, the first sentence even is one that plays around with tenses in an interesting way. It said, she would contact me if mum died. She has to, hasn't she? And you can see it switches tenses there. She would contact me if mum died. So she would if that was going to happen. She has to, hasn't she? As in she has to contact me now because maybe the mother has already died i'm not sure i explained that very well but the first when i read that sentence i tripped over and i thought is this a bad translation because that doesn't really make sense but then i realized no she's playing around with tenses and that is a lot of fun to me also 
these sentences are ones that run on with lots and lots of commas and again I thought commas don't really belong in many of these places there should be a full stop or a semicolon or a colon a comma is not really appropriate we're putting together two full sentences three full sentences four full sentences what is going on why aren't we using semicolons and it's because the narrator doesn't want to separate these ideas for her everything is happening and is being felt all at once and therefore it needs to be part of one sentence with a lot of commas and again I am intrigued by this. So I'm gonna keep reading this and I will come back to you when I finish, but I have a feeling that I'm going to adore this book. So I will check in with you tomorrow. Hi, it's early in the morning a few days later and as I predicted, I absolutely Love this book. This is what I love about prizes. I don't think I would have heard about this book if it wasn't for this prize and I've fallen in love with it. I would recommend it for fans of The Faster I Walk, The Smaller I Am by Kirsty A. Scomswold. So this, as I mentioned in the last clip, is about a woman. Her name is Joanna. She's moved back to Norway and she doesn't know if her family is still alive. She doesn't know if her mother is alive because she hasn't spoken to her in decades ever since her family disowned her for painting whatever she happened to paint that they think disgraced the family. But Joanna has been through a lot. Her husband has died. She also has a son of her own. And what's interesting is at the beginning of this book, you feel as though, or at least I felt, that maybe she was around my age because she feels quite young. And I think that's because she still has this yearning for her mother. Not that that's something that you grow out of as you get older, but it feels as though that relationship hasn't evolved and is still as it would be if she was in her 30s. And that's because it was frozen in time at that point because she hasn't spoken to her since then. And it's only as the book progresses that we realise that she's actually 60 years old. So her mother is going to be very old. She thinks that she's probably in her late 80s, so she can't remember or at least it's pretending she doesn't remember and what she could do is she could go around to her mother's house and knock on the door and talk to her she's looked her up in the directory she knows where her address is she doesn't know if she is alive and living in it but her mother is registered to this address she also knows where her sister Ruth lives and she could go around and talk to her but she can't bring herself to do it so instead what she does is she kind of just starts stalking both of them she becomes this observer and that complements her role as artist because that's what she likes to do she likes to observe life and then recreate it she says i live a secret life in mum's mind and mum lives a secret one in mine but i'm in the process of unearthing her from the darkness dragging her out into the light and slowly she emerges because i want it to happen this is a book that tries to piece together who her mother is as a character in her own right. Joanna wants to understand her mum as a person to make excuses for why she behaved in the way she did when she was a child. Joanna is constructing this narrative, which is obviously quite meta when we're talking about novels. She says, the figure in front of me remains sketchy and uninteresting. The space around it lacks depth. This book I found so incredibly moving and I don't want to talk about it much more than that because I think it's one I just would like people to discover for themselves. I mean I, I could say that about every single book obviously but I don't want to give too much away about this. It is all about peeling back layers or I guess adding layers if we're talking about painting and it's about analysing who is a reliable narrator not just within the text but within our lives and the stories that we tell ourselves about our paths, paths, well yes paths, I meant pasts and how we fabricate stories to fill in gaps in memories either to comfort ourselves and protect ourselves or maybe to defend ourselves. So is this narrative from the point of view of Joanna and her discussion of her childhood, is that truthful? 
And is that something she can even gauge if she's only conversing with herself and not with her family? I thought that it was fascinating and I absolutely adored it. Then I have also read this, which is The Gospel According to the New World by Maurice Conzi. And um, I don't have a huge amount to say about this one. This is about a boy who is told that he is the son of God. It's a gospel parody set in the Caribbean and the main character is a boy called Pascal. And yes, it's exploring Christianity, but also many different religions. It even touches on Greek mythology at one point because he grows up and he gets a motorbike and calls it Pegasus. And the beginning of this book is very reminiscent of Disney's Hercules, which may sound uh, a bit reductive, but I think it's deliberately trying to do that. It's just pulling together lots of different mythologies and having fun with it. I found this book quite repetitive because Pascal goes out into the world to try and find himself. And in every situation, he does exactly the same thing. He goes to a new place. He becomes infatuated with a woman. He sleeps with her. He falls out of love with her. And then he moves on and he does it all over again. And I think that that repetition is quite tongue in cheek, saying that history repeats itself itself again and again both on a small scale like that but also with regard to big things like colonialism and capitalism, um, white supremacy and people using narratives like religion to get what they want and there is also a meta layer in this playing around with the idea of an author being godlike as well and playing around with all her characters and making them do whatever she wants them to do. I had a similar feeling to this book as I did when I read ages ago, like probably nearly 20 years ago now, The Good Man Jesus and the Scoundrel Christ by Philip Pullman, in that I thought it was an interesting idea, but it kind of ran out of steam somewhere along the way. And the big idea that it started with was just not enough to sustain it. So I like this, but I didn't love it. Um, today I am going to go and meet up with Lauren and um, some of you may have followed Lauren's channel. I don't know what her channel is called now. It used to be Reads and Daydreams. I think it's Lauren Wade Reads now. I don't think I'm going to film too much on our walk because we're just going to be catching up with each other and also her daughter will be with us too which I'm uh, very much looking forward to but I will insert some footage of that here and then I will check back in with you later. Excuse the lighting, it's the evening, we're in the kitchen, I'm about to make dinner, but I just wanted to hop on here and say that I think it's a crime for me to not enjoy a book with such a stunning cover. This is Whale by Chung Myung Kwan and it's translated from the Korean by Chi Young Kim. The cover is the best thing about this book in my opinion, which is a harsh thing to say, but it is how I feel. The cover is by Geneva Rapisadi. And I should have trusted my gut instinct with this one because I was offered a review copy of it at the end of last year and I wasn't sure about it um, because as I said, there is visual difference disability mentioned in the blurb and I took a look at a sample and I just wasn't pulled in by the writing style. So I really should have left it there, but it was long listed for this prize and I thought the premise does sound quite whimsical and maybe something that would appeal to me because it is inspired by fairy tale. But unfortunately, it's it's not for me at all. And I've read about 60 pages and I'm gonna part ways with it. I can't see me changing my mind about this book. 
at all. So we're following a series of characters who are related and it feels as though you're reading a Giambattista Basile fairy tale because they're going on adventures and ridiculous things happen to them and B characters wander into the narrative and out again to facilitate the movement of the story. As I mentioned this is a book from 20 years ago that just recently was translated into English but it feels even older than 20 years ago. There's so much sexism in here, every woman's breasts are described, um, visual difference and disability are used as punchlines quite often and also there's just a lot of juvenile humour in here. So there's a man who has a foot-long penis which is talked about a lot and there's a lot of jokes to do with feces and I just think, really? So yeah, this one is, is not for me. Occasionally there would be a paragraph where I thought, wait, hang on, is this book turning into something different like this? Oddly, the honeybee settled on his body, creating a big black lump. His bee-covered corpse looked like a large rock lying on its side. They held on tight to his body, flapping their wings quickly, the way they did when they fought wasps. When the one-eyed girl tried to swat them off the corpse, his body felt so hot that she flinched and stepped back. Later, people would say the bees were blowing warmth into his body, or that it was actually their way of expressing sorrow. Some even said it was actually the bees that killed the beekeeper. So I was intrigued by magical paragraphs like that and then it would just dive back into sexism and juvenile humour. So no thank you. I'm going to move on to another book on the long list but right the second I'm going to make pasta. So let's do that. It's Sunday morning, the day that this video is going to be uploaded. Um, and I'm having a bit of a sad morning, which I don't particularly want to dwell on, but I just wanted to mention, in case anyone else is having a sad day today. Today in the UK is um, Mother's Day. And if you're in North America or elsewhere where Mother's Day is not today, don't worry, you haven't missed it. It's <laughs> You have it on a different day, or we have, it on, we have it on different days. So I just wanted to send love to anyone else who's also having a sad time for whatever reason. Um, days like this can be complicated for so many different reasons, can't they? Um, and also, grief is so odd, which is not a profound thing to say. <laughs> it's a very obvious thing to say. But sometimes you can be fine and then sometimes you can really not be fine and that can hit you just out of absolute, well, not nowhere, but can just really get you in a way that you weren't expecting it to do on that particular day and that today is for me, um, I was hoping to be five months pregnant about now, and I am very much not. So yeah, what a, oh, too many feelings for this early on a Sunday, too many, too many feelings. Um, books. Um, I ordered Boulder by Eva Balthazar, 
I think that that's her name, I think so, on Tuesday. And I was hoping it would be delivered this weekend, but then I got an email to say that my order had been cancelled because I think they must have over-fulfilled and they actually didn't have enough stock to fulfil it. So um, I went on the Waterstones website and I checked to see if any branches near me have a copy. And I thought they wouldn't because it was um, sold out of lots of different places. And I had ordered my copy from um, a bookshop online and they actually do have a copy. So they have a copy apparently, because sometimes it's not always accurate. Sometimes they say they do, or maybe by the time you get there, they don't have it anymore. Um, but I'm gonna go on a hunt. Let's go on a treasure hunt for a book. They said that they have a copy at the Hampstead branch of Waterstones, which is relatively oh, far away if we're walking. It's, it's quite a far walk. Quite that's, That wasn't good English. It is quite far away. Um, but, you know, it's nice to go on a walk. And I know that this video is going to be uploaded today, but I checked and this book is only 112 pages long. So I'm hoping that I can walk over there, which should take me just over an hour. Um, can walk there, buy it, and then the weather's looking a bit questionable, so I don't know if I can sit and read it outside, maybe I can. But anyway, regardless, I would like to read it today and talk to you about it, and if I don't finish it, I can at least talk to you about the beginning of it, but I should be able to read all of that today. So um, that's the plan, Mr M is out for a long walk with one of his friends today, so I have the day to myself, and I don't really want to wallow. <laughs> so um, this is why it's good to have um, videos like this. I know that reviewing books is part of my job in various different forms, not just on here, but in on different platforms. Um, but, you know, having projects like this to focus on, I like doing it for my job, but I also, you know, enjoy doing it from having a project point of view when things aren't feeling so good. Um, so thank you for allowing me to be able to do that. Um, and yeah, Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna get dressed and I'm gonna not suppress the feelings because you should feel your feelings. Um, I don't want to just pretend I'm feeling fine, but um, I'm gonna get dressed and go for a walk and that should hopefully help a little bit. Um, and yes, we can track down this book and then read it. So let's go and do that. And for anyone else who's having a difficult time today, for whatever reason, mwah, I'm sending lots and lots of love to you. Okay. I'm dressed, let's go. I've packed a sandwich in my bag. I feel very prepared and it doesn't look like it's going to rain. So let's hope it stays that way. Let's go. That was super easy. And also, two out of the three booksellers today in there were wearing Lucy and Yak dungarees, so clearly they are my people. Um, actually, let's go down this way. And who remembers from my, from a previous vlog where I was talking about the crepe wars? Let's see what the queues are like today and then go on to the heath. There are no crepe wars yet because the crepery isn't open. So let's just go on to the heath.
didn't end up reading all of the book when I was out, far from it actually, I've read the first 17 pages. I'm going to finish reading it now and I'll talk about it in this vlog, but it's, it's warm enough to be walking around very comfortably because it's uh, definitely a few degrees warmer than it was last week, but it's still not, you know, sitting outside reading for long periods of time weather. Also, I didn't have a pen with me and I was itching to underline so many things and that's a very, very good sign for me. So this is about a queer woman who's got a job working as a chef on a boat and this is all this imagery to do with feeling like each person is an island on this ship um, or that the ship is very pregnant with people. I don't know, I'm just really liking the way that it is written. So this is Boulder by Eva Balsan. It's translated from the Catalan by Julia Sanchez. Let me read you a couple of sentences. I develop an interest in empanadas. They're practical and everyone likes them, even though the meat I use is tinned and the olives need more brine. I start the dough in the evenings and let it rise all night. I like to get under the covers knowing that out there another covered body lies awake, working on my behalf. In the morning I'm amazed by how much it's risen, as if the whole thing, the soft perfect dome of wheat and its nest bowl of warmth were a distant nephew who's grown up effortless effortlessly and all of a sudden in the silence of my absence. I love that. Okay, I'm gonna have this cup of tea and get warm and read this book. I'll be back in a bit. Oh hi, I'm back and I have finished reading Boulder and I absolutely love this book. As I said, it's about a woman who's working on a ship and she is making food for other people. She loves bringing things to life with her hands and then she can give those things to other people and they swallow them and they disappear and she has nothing more to do with them and she likes that repetitive process. Her favourite thing to make is empanadas and they are like pregnant pastries but again those disappear into people's mouths and she can forget about them and she has little to do with the people that she's working with. She likes being very isolated and cut off from them, being like an island or a boulder as her partner nicknames her later. So one day the ship docks and she leaves the ship and she meets a woman who she becomes completely infatuated with but both of these women even though they have a lot of desire for one another, aren't really communicating properly and think that their desire is enough to sustain them. And they are together for a very long time and they decide to move to Reykjavik to um, set up life there. And the narrator's partner then says that she would like to have a child. And Boulder, who's our main character, um, her partner has nicknamed her that because she's a geologist and she's very interested in rocks. Again, these isolated, island type things, um, Boulder feels as though she's been conned and tricked into settling down and being just like everyone else. It's very funny the way that she talks about land dwellers and people who want to have families, whereas Boulder wants to be someone who's at sea and is anchorless and is going on adventures and doesn't know what the next day brings and how, how dare capitalism and its society and its demand for procreation tie herself to this earth. It's very over the top dramatic and funny, but is of course at the same time discussing very serious things. But Boulder doesn't communicate with her partner, Samza. She doesn't say at any point, I don't want any of this. And that is reflected in this book by the fact that there is no dialogue, no dialogue. This is just Boulder telling us what has happened. And that cuts us off from everyone else in her life. It means that we only get to see her, which maintains that feeling of isolation that she wants in her life. It also means that we have to rely on everything that she says is happening. And she also uses a huge number of similes. At the beginning of every paragraph, there is a simile. Something is like something else. And this pattern of similes, at first I thought, well, oh, that's a bit exhausting can we think of other ways to describe things but actually this pattern is very deliberate it is a displacement by saying that something looks like something else or feels like something else she avoids actually discussing what the thing itself is she resists going under the surface to accurately examine her own feelings in real time. It also has a result of making things feel unrooted and less real, and it reflects her wandering eye. I can't remember the exact 
quote, but at one point she bemoans the fact that adults are no longer like magpies, whereas children are always looking for the new shiny thing. And that's what she's doing. She's always looking for the new shiny thing. The thing that reminds her of what she desired before, the less permanent future. Boulder is a very intriguing and frustrating character. She's very selfish, not because she doesn't want to be a parent, that doesn't mean that you're selfish at all, but because she refuses to explain her feelings to anybody else. Basically, she's quite intrigued by life and she wants other people to make decisions on her behalf and then she'll watch it be acted out around her and then at what she considers to be the interval of this play of life, she'll be like, right, well, that act was interesting. I'm not particularly on board for act two, so I'll just leave you here to deal with all of this responsibility, and I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna exit quietly out the back. <laughs> it is very theatrical, and she is very dismissive of other people, and that is fun to read about in a book. I wouldn't like to be friends with her in real life, but it does make for an interesting read. So I really enjoyed that one. Um, so that brings us to the end of this video and the end of me reading half of this year's International Booker Prize. Long list and a real mixed bag, as I find it often is for this prize when I followed it in the past. So out of the six that I have read, if I was going to rank them in order of my least favourite to my most favourite, number six would obviously be Whale. And then number five would be, I think, this one, The Gospel According to the New World. Then at number four, I think I, I'm not sure what would be four and three. I think these could switch order depending on what day you happen to be speaking to me. That's still born and standing heavy. Number two, I think I would have Boulder. And then number one is going to be Is a Mother Dead? And I really, really loved both of these books. So these would be the ones that I would want to press into people's hands. I would love to know if you have read any of the books from the International Booker. If there are any from the other half of the shortlist which you think I would particularly enjoy and which ones you are going to consider picking up yourself if you haven't read any of them yet. Thank you very much for joining me. If you are new and you would like to subscribe that would be lovely and if you enjoy my content and you would like to consider supporting me on Patreon that would be very kind. Link to that is in the description box down below. Patreon is a place where you can tip your favourite creators and support over there it allows me to keep creating free content for everybody on here and also funds my time making this accessible by creating captions for videos and all of that good stuff. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope you're doing okay and I'm sending lots of love to you all. Bye.